right, when you get that Bible, open up to the book of Nehemiah. While they're passing those Bibles out, don't worry, we got more. Just keep your hands raised. All right, uh, while we're doing that, I want to ask you a question. We just sang a song about the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when I uh, put that word out there and say holy, what kind of things come to your mind when you think about being holy? Uh, I think for most of us, what comes to our mind is a quietness, is a solemnness, is a serious place to be. It's a, it's a meditative, it's a mature kind of place to be. We're going to go into this place of being holy. And, and we know that around the throne, there are all these creatures on their knees saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It just seems majestic and it seems very reverent. And, and all that is critical. And I'm not denying any of that. I think that's true. I think that's just part of the holiness of God and understanding that. But here's my question for today. What does it take to get to that place of holiness? Where does that start? How do we get to that place of holiness? I want to use Nehemiah today to show you a biblical plan for getting that place of reverence and holiness. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in the book of Nehemiah, where we're going to pick it up at. The children of God have left um, Israel, and they've been moved into Babylon. Uh, they're under captivity there. Uh, for 490 years in the land, in, the, in Israel, uh, they were not following God. Uh, they were not resting the land as they were supposed to rest the land. And there was this uh, not following God mentality that ended up putting them in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. Well, while there, Nehemiah approaches King Artaxerxes and says, we'd like to go back and we'd like to rebuild the city. We'd like to build the walls back in Jerusalem. And he is granted the ability to do that. So he leaves with a whole group of people. Uh, a group has gone just before them under Ezra and he goes back there and they're going back to basically rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, reestablish Jerusalem. And so we're going to pick it up at that point in the story when they've gone back and they've started that rebuilding process. They came against all kind of obstacles, uh, but in Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, we hit a story that I want to show you uh, in its relevance for us today. Uh, so without reading the whole chapter to you, if we were to read from verse 1 down to verse 8 of chapter 8, here's what's going on. They find the, the Torah, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books, the law of Moses, and Ezra comes out to a wooden podium, and he begins reading this to them. Now, keep in mind, they've been in Babylon for 70 years, so they haven't been operating under this law of Moses. But Ezra begins to read to them the law of Moses. Uh, and so here they are gathered. They've heard these stories. And the Levites, the tribe of Levite, is going around and explaining to the people what Ezra is reading. So as Ezra reads the law of Moses... Then the Levites come to the people and try to explain to them, hey, this is what that means. This is what it's saying we should be doing. This is how that works out in our life. So they're understanding what's going on when the book is read. So let's start in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9. Verse 9, I want to show you their response to that reading. If you got it, say, I got it. Got it. If you don't, say, wait. Pretty good, only two waits. <laughs> Nehemiah 8, 9. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people and said to all of the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all of the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Now that's the point I want to start on today. Here's what's happening. They've all come back after a 70-year exile. And they're reading the law of Moses. They're reading the words of God for them as a people. And they're comparing the words of God to themselves. And there's a great conviction that's happening. They're recognizing they have not followed this law. And you'll see later on in the story the proof that they had not been following the law of Moses. And so this is being read to them, and there's a conviction that's coming over them. They're weeping, and they're getting sad, and they're not knowing what to do with it. We call that conviction in our walk today. Uh, but because they were seeing that what they were living out and what the law of their God was was different, there became a mourning. It became a sadness. I don't think it's really any different from you and I. I think when you and I really get into a scripture and a conviction comes that this is what God calls us to, this is where he wants us to be, and we realize, hey, I'm just not there, our first response 
It's kind of a sadness. It's kind of a mourning. It's kind of a conviction. It's kind of a, yeah, I know, God, that's what you want, and I'm not there, and I just don't know what to think about myself, and, but I want you to watch what happens here because what happens to them, I believe, is a recipe for what should be happening for us. So they've read this, and they've begun weeping. Now look at verse 10. Then he said to them, Go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord God. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people and said, Be still, the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Now listen, that doesn't sync with me. I just got convicted by the word of God. It's showing me that I'm falling short of what he called me to do. And I'm feeling this mourning and grieving. And this is what they're saying. You're weeping? Go out, eat a steak, have some sweet tea, bring some over to your friend's house. And, and let's re- don't, don't be sad. Don't be grieved. And I'm like conflicted inside now. I'm saying, what do you mean don't be grieved? I'm, I'm feeling the conviction over the word of God, and you're telling me to go out and eat of the fat and drink of the sweet and go have a meal with my neighbors? This doesn't really make sense. Keep reading. 11. So the Levites, they calmed all the people, and they said, Be still, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people, they went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words that had been made known to them. Now, I'm just telling you, I got a tension inside of me when I read this because what's happening, and he's saying, stop feeling bad, go have a party. Just go have a party. God has shown you this stuff, you're convicted in your heart, but now go celebrate and go have a party. Why? Listen, because sometimes the most authentic I can be The most authentic I can be is to express my faith when circumstances don't agree. The most authentic I can be is to walk in faith when my circumstances don't agree. Here's what I mean by that. We understand this concept of rejoicing when God is convicting us in other ways. We just don't understand it here. In other words, we can get excited when we're under conviction in other areas. Because we know that there's some work we're going to have to do, but there's an exciting point coming. Let me tell you what I mean by that. When you get to the place where you want to lose weight so you can get back into all those clothes in your closet, you know there's work you have to do. But you're actually excited about doing the work because you're going to get back into the clothes in your closet. That's never happened to you. (laughs) Listen, I just lost 25 pounds. I had four pants left in my closet that I could wear out of all of them because I couldn't fit into them anymore. So not eating was the work I did for the joy of being able to pick any (laughs) pair of pants and put it on. It was great. Uh, Okay, it's like when you're not in shape, okay, what do you got to do to get in shape? Wait for my muscles to get bigger? No, I have to go work out. There is work I have to do, but the end goal of being in shape makes me want to do that. There's an excitement that comes over me, even though I know... Let me see if I can appeal to some of you others. When your your lawn looks bad, what do you got to do? Mow it. But you know what it's going to look like when you're done. It's going to look good. It's going to have all those little grooves and edges along the sidewalk. It's all going to be level. There's not going to be weeds here and there. And you're going to walk away and say, my house looks good. So there's an excitement that comes even though there's work I have to do. Listen to me. The conviction that was coming on these people, he was saying, no, don't be sad. Rejoice. Rejoice because that's where God wants you to go. That's what's coming up. You're going to be excited about being thin. You're going to be excited about being in shape. You're going to be exciting about good-looking law. Now let's do the work to get there. So we know the results so we can get excited about what's coming. Now, here's the thing about this story in Nehemiah. This is what he's saying. God is saying, listen, I give you my word. You're feeling convicted. That's not what I want you to do. What I want you to do is when I give you my word, I want you to be excited about what it's going to change in you. I want you to be excited about where we're going. I want you to be excited about what's coming. Listen, you want to be close to me, God says, I want you to rejoice and celebrate. 
I want you to rejoice. And, and I'm thinking in the first service, I was thinking, why is that, God? Why would you want us to rejoice and celebrate? Listen to me. If I am in conviction and I go before God, what is my entire conversation going to be about? Oh, God, I've kind of messed this up. I'm sorry. I'm whining. I feel bad. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I'd stayed closer to you. But if I go and I rejoice and I celebrate first, I've got my mind and my attention on God. So when I go before God, instead of whining, I can say, you are so awesome and so loving to forgive me, to show me the error of my ways, to get me back on a path. And so he tells the folks in Nehemiah, stop grieving. Stop grieving under the conviction of the word. What you should do under the conviction of the word is begin rejoicing. It's not a difficult thing to do. It's difficult to make the transition mentally, but it's not a difficult thing to do in the process. Do you remember when Jesus says, my burden is easy and my yoke is light? The work sounds like a burden and the work sounds like heavy. The yoke does, but it's actually easy. It's actually light. See, the people in Nehemiah 8, they wanted to be right with God. And it made them sad that they were not. And God tells them, no, I want you to rejoice in the conviction that you're receiving because something better is coming. Something good is coming your way. In other words, recognize that you know what's wrong and then let's do the work. What's the work? What do you tell them to do? Celebrate. Rejoice. Celebrate and rejoice. That's a work we had to do to get to that place. How does that work out here? Here's why it's a conflict for you and me. For you and me in this world, we rejoice because there's a joy in our life. When there's a joy in our life, we can rejoice. But in the kingdom, we have joy because we rejoice. Oh, oh fush, you're not. You're going to get there, I promise you. Listen to me. Watch this. They were not following God and he said, rejoice and celebrate. Think about it. They were not right with God, but he said, now is the time to rejoice and to celebrate. I'm reminded of Philippians 4, 4, where it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. I mean, there is a time. There is a time for repentance and weeping. There is a time. That's a legitimate thing. There is a time for conviction that overwhelms you. There's a time to cry before God. There's a time to be prostrate. And you're going to see how it works out in this case, how they did that, when they did that. Let me show you. Let me show you. Let's go into, back to Nehemiah chapter 8. But I want you to look at verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3. When Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women and all who could... Uh, Men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. That's critical to our story. Ezra is reading the word of God on the first day of the seventh month. So that's when they're hearing this. Verse 3, he read from it before the square, and it was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. On the first day of the seventh month, now go down in your scripture to verse 13, because they heard this word, and they began to weep on that first day. But Nehemiah 8.13 says this, then on the second day, so we know what happened on the first day. The word comes out. Conviction comes. They begin to weep, but they're told, stop weeping. Stop weeping and start rejoicing. Then on the second day, the heads of the father's household of all the people, the priests and the Levites, they were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. Now look at 14. It's critical. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded them through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast in the seventh month. They found it in the law. In other words, they didn't know they were supposed to be doing it, but now they understand, hey, it's the seventh month. And according to this word of God, we're supposed to be living in booths in the seventh month. So this is on the second day. First day they hear the word, they get convicted. Second day they read and they say, hey, there's this feast we're supposed to be doing. Fifteen. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem saying, go out to the hills and bring in olive branches and wild olive branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. 
So the people went out, and they brought them, and they made booths for themselves, each one on his roof, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. The entire assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, to that day. Do you remember me telling you earlier they were not following the word of God? They were not following the word of God while they were in captivity. And now, here we have, from the time of Joshua, they haven't been doing this, and they read it, and they found it, and they learned it, and so they were going to do it. Now let's keep reading. And there was great... <laughs> and there was great... Rejoicing. Yeah, that's a positive word. That's a happy word. There was great rejoicing. Oh, it's another day to rejoice. 18. He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first to the last day. Now, let me tell you what the first to the last day means. It means during that feast. From the first to the last day of this eight-day feast. And they celebrated the feast seven days. Now, listen. They got this direction on day two, right? Then they had to go out and get branches and build these booths. So they, they got convicted on day one. On day two, they learned they're supposed to be doing this feast. So they go gather branches, and they celebrate for seven days. And then on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. In other words, in the law of God, it's to celebrate for seven days, and then there'll be a solemn assembly. Go to chapter 9. Chapter 9. We're going to read in verse 1. Chapter 9. Now on the 24th day of the month, the sons of Israel assembled with and in and with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Now keep with the story. They are sad. They are grieving. He says, no, 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 no. This is a holy day. This is a holy day, so you should be celebrating. You should be rejoicing. That's first. We're going to spend seven days partying. We're going to spend seven days eating of the fat, drinking of the sweet, having meals with each other. We're going to rejoice. We're going to party. We're going to celebrate. And then we're going to come together after that, and we're going to mourn, and we're going to confess our sins. Why? Why? Why is he telling them that? Why is this thing set up to where we have seven days, and then look at three. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law, uh, the book of the Lord their God. For the fourth of the day, for another fourth of the day, they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. So they spent a fourth of a day, sun up to sundown, 12 hours. They spent a fourth of a day confessing their sins. I mean, no offense, but if you've got three or four hours to confess your sins, you've got to go deep. You've got to go deep. But here they are confessing their sins. But they were confessing their sins after they rejoiced. After they rejoiced. See, we don't think this way. We don't think this way. What we think is, I got to get my life straightened up and cleaned up before I can rejoice. I got to get to a place where it's not right to stand before God and rejoice when I know I got things that I'm not doing right. I know I got things I'm not doing right, God. Therefore, I can't rejoice in you. And yet for 70 years... They had not been doing right. And when they learned of it and found out, he said, party. He said, go celebrate. Go rejoice. There's going to be a time for you to confess. There's going to be a time for you to repent. There's going to be a time for you to mourn, for you to fast. But right now, I just want you to rejoice. And I, I believe that is because we got to come before God with him first. We got to come before God with saying, you are the one we celebrate. You're the one we rejoice in. You're the one we lift up. You're the one we magnify. And so now we confess. Listen, ah, I don't get ahead of myself. Praise God that we don't have to clean up our act to get saved. Amen. Praise God that I don't have to become perfect before I can be made perfect. Listen, uh, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. In other words, he knew you were steeped in it. He knew you weren't following God. He knew you were a mess. He knew about the pornography. He knew about the affairs. He knew about the gossip. He knew about all of that stuff, and yet he died for you anyways. 
He died for you and he didn't ask you to get cleaned up before. You don't have to go through a qualification process where as soon as you get these things right in your life and somebody else and looks and says, it appears they're holy, so now they can be saved. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. For them, 70 years of not following God. And he said, have a party, man. Have a party. It doesn't make sense. Here's why. Here's why this system works. If you'll grab this, it'll make sense for you. You need strength in order to confess your sins. I need strength in order to stand before God and say, I have been wrong. I have disobeyed. I want to confess this. I want to get in front of you. Now, let me ask you, where do they get their strength? The joy of the Lord is my Okay, so when he says rejoice first, did he say put your joy into action so I can give you strength? No. This is what he said. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But rejoice, because when you rejoice, the joy of the Lord, God's joy, comes to you. Watch this. If I were to bring a baby into this room, and I were to stand up here, and I'd give him a little tickle, and he broke out laughing, what would you do? Why? Why? Because the joy of the baby got into you. So God is saying, when you rejoice, my joy will come into you and give you strength. Come on. Come on. You get this because salvation is like this. Okay? Salvation is like this. Conviction comes before joy. When the word gets into me, there's a conviction, but that conviction brings joy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit comes. John 16 says that he will come and he will convict those who don't believe in Jesus. So there has to be a conviction of the word first, but the results of the conviction of the word are salvation. And there's joy and there's celebration. So we get that in the salvation process that, man, when I get convicted, what should come next is the joy of the Lord comes in and I get strength from that. That's why the priests are saying, you're feeling convicted? Awesome. You're about to start dieting. You're about to start working out. Crank up the lawnmower. We're going for it. The yard's going to look great. That's why the priest is saying to him, if the conviction of God is coming on you, it's time to celebrate. It's time to rejoice. It's time. We don't get that. We want to feel good before we rejoice. And he's saying, no, in your mess, rejoice, and I'll send you my joy, and you'll feel good. You'll be strong. Come on. Come on. So the priests are saying... Don't be grieved because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Rejoice. Is there any other time you can think of in Scripture where joy comes with the conviction? I can. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. We know this story is the parable of the four soils. Throwing out seed. Lands on different kinds of soils. But there's one soil. I want to show you how it applies to what we're teaching today. Matthew 13, 20. We're going to talk about the second soil. It says, the one whom the seed was sown onto a rocky place, this is the man who hears the word. Now remember, the word of God comes with conviction. So he has heard the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. Why? If he's heard the word, here's the word he heard. You've been disrespectful and disobedient to God. That's the conviction that came. But God has made a way to save you. There's the joy that comes rushing in. So it, he immediately received it with joy. Should all be good from here. It says, but he has no firm root in himself. What does that no firm root in himself mean? It means he doesn't understand that that joy is the strength that comes from God. That I can receive that. That I can hold on to it. Uh, Colossians 2.6 says it this way. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed by the word. It's entrenched. It's not temporary. I'm overflowing with the gratitude. And then it says, but it's only temporary, the joy. But man, you got you to get this. Got to get this. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the... 
Come on, say it. Word. Word. Affliction and persecution arises because of the Word. word. So listen, it's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you failed. It's not because you didn't completely get it and you were no good at it. And and so God took it. The affliction arises because of the Word. Now think about this. Why would Satan come after the Word? Because the Word comes with joy that gives you strength. Received it with joy, but it wasn't firmly rooted. Didn't completely understand it. Falls away. So Satan comes and steals that word out so the joy and the strength don't come along with it. So now Satan is coming after us to get the word to remove the joy. The conviction came by the word. It came with joy. Satan goes after the word to steal the word out of you so that you will not have joy. The word brings joy. Satan goes after the word to remove the joy. But, but, the joy is your strength. Going back to verse 10 in Nehemiah. For the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when I get the word, got to be firmly rooted, got to understand it, got to grab this, got to hold on to it. I get joy and joy brings me strength. So the sequence is the word, conviction, joy, strength. Okay? So if I'm hearing the word, God sends me his joy I get strength from that. Stay with me. With strength comes power. Not difficult for us to understand. The strong are powerful, right? Uh, Those things that have strength are the things that are powerful. Ephesians 3.16 says it like this. According to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power with the Holy Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. Okay. I got the word. Lord's joy came to me. It became my strength. I am strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit. What do we call it when we're strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit? Anointing. We get anointed by the Holy Spirit. What happens when someone gets anointed? They get an assignment. When David got anointed, it was anointed to be king. When the apostles got anointed on the day of Pentecost, it was to share the gospel boldly. So here it comes with I'm going to put all this together for you. You ready? Ready? Everybody hang on. Record this part right here. Take notes. The word brings joy. Joy brings strength. Strength brings power. Power brings anointing. Anointing brings assignment. And then you're on the road with God. Come on. Come on. Now, let's go back. Where did it all start? It all started with our response to the conviction of hearing the word and our response being rejoicing. Rejoicing. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like we should be rejoicing if we're under conviction. But listen to me. I don't care where you are in your walk today. I don't care where you are. It doesn't matter to me if you're 70 years of not following God. It doesn't matter to me if you read something today and all of a sudden you realize God's been expecting something of you that you haven't delivered. I don't care. If you want strength, rejoicing brings the joy of the Lord and you get that strength. So if you want strength, start by rejoicing. If you want to confess your sins, start by rejoicing. If you want to receive power, start by rejoicing. If you want an anointing, start by rejoicing. If you want an assignment, start by rejoicing. Now listen to me. You are not listening to a motivational speech. You're not listening to a pep talk. You're not listening for something that's trying to emotionally make you feel better today so you'll go out of here thinking, well, I just got to rejoice and it's all good. I'm telling you that when conviction came to the word for the people in Nehemiah's day, Ezra, Nehemiah, the Levites, the priest all stood up and said, do not grieve. Right now we're under conviction. And when you're under conviction, what you need to do is rejoice. You need to get up and rejoice. You need to be the one who's recognizing, I have to rejoice. Rejoicing is the work of joy. We look at the results we get, we start with rejoicing. doesn't matter where I am, I start with rejoicing. If I'm looking for conviction, I start with rejoicing. If I want an assignment from God, I start from rejoicing. That's why Philippians 4 says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he says, and again, in case you didn't get it the first time, and again, what you need to do is rejoice. So here's our goal. If you're struggling, if you came in here in a bad attitude, if you're having a bad week, I've had one. If you're in that place of just 
bummed out, if you're under conviction from the word of God, listen to me. What he says is, be the baby in the room. Rejoice. 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 Because when you rejoice, I send my joy to be your strength. Hey, I want to thank you so much for joining us today in our message. I sincerely hope that God has blessed you in it. I sincerely hope that the Holy Spirit is moving in your life and planting those words in you. If you want to know more about Revive Church, just join us on our website at reviveusnow.com or come to our services at 851 Johnson Street in Stewart, Florida. We would love to get to know you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day.